Well, hello everybody. We'll probably get um, people kind of meandering in late. I, I expect it to be, there's an overflow room over here, so just it's no more seats to drag people out if you could. Uh, so with this is an incredible pleasure here. We have uh, Professor Andrew Jordan from the University of Rochester. Um, and uh, Andrew is, is one of the, our members of the Institute for Quantum Studies here. And he's been, I think, since the beginning, he's been one of our great contributors and members and big supporters. And we're so grateful, Andrew. Thank you so much for everything you've done. So this year, he actually has an entire year-long sabbatical. And he's spending it here, of all the places in the world we could be. He's, he's here. Yay! <coughs> And uh, he brought his whole family, and he brought his, his entire, almost his entire group. So um, if you see more postdocs running around than usual, then that's, uh, that's Andrew. Um, and we also have one of Andrew's collaborators, Kata Merch from uh, Washington University. And uh, you'll see an interesting uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 balance between the two of them. So Andrew is a, a theoretical physicist, and I always regard Cater as also a theoretical physicist, but he's really an experimental physicist, right? So, um, so that's a, a very important balance to have. Anyway, we're thrilled to have Cater here. Um, and one other note, since we do have an experimentalist here, um, if you want to ask a question at the end or in the middle, uh, we have these things here, and you have to press what do you do? You press speak, and then it lights up, and you go, hello, yes, yes. and then, and then if you don't want people to hear what you're saying, you press speak again. So that's it. And um, I give you uh, Professor Andrew Jordan and Professor Kamer. putting his microphone on. I just wanted to thank you, Jeff, for this very nice introduction. I wanted to thank Chapman University for welcoming us here and for being uh, so hospitable, particularly the Institute for Quantum Studies, uh, which has been a pleasure to work with from, from the beginning. So, so this is a special presentation. Uh, this, is, this is funded by the John Thimbleton Foundation, as you see there on the right-hand side. And uh, we, we thought we'd start out this presentation by showing you a Roman god. And the Roman god there is uh, Janus, and we thought we'd present two Roman gods up here. <laughs> but we also have our muse, and our, and our muse is Alyssa Ney, who's the, who's the professor of philosophy. And so after we end up speaking, we're going to sort of turn over her, to her for her pearls of wisdom uh, to add to our uh, discussion. So, so let me, let me, so, so it's going to be a fun, because this is going to be a, uh, dynamic, uh, creative exchange between Cater and myself. This is all mostly improvisational, so hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as we do. So Cater, why don't you start us off here? So we're here to talk about the arrow of time. And I think we all agree that time seems to go forward. Some people seem to say But most of us, I think, we agree that in the past is fairly certain compared to the future. You have no idea what we're going to say, except for those of Andrew's postdocs who are listening and will prepare this talk for the last hour. And the question is, why does time seem to go forward? That's what we're going to try to discuss and analyze and visit today. And to give you an example of that, uh, this is an example I encounter every day. I have a seven-year-old son. And uh, at some point, maybe once a year, his room looks like this, very neat and orderly. And then later on, time goes on, and I know, ah, now it's just like what it normally looks like. It's all spread out, everything crumbled, just the right. And the physics is a fancy name for this arrow of time. We call it the second law of thermodynamics, that entropy, which is somehow related to disorder, messiness, it almost always increases. So that's kind of what my house looks like too, Cater. I've got I've got four kids. So that's four times the entropy, I guess, being produced. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but what makes the difference? What, 
why do we think that entropy or this idea of order versus disorder, what, what, what's, the, what's the distinguishing characteristic between those two states of being? Well, this one looks like the way it should be, and this one is all for density. And the question is, you know, why, why is this one more likely to, why did it end up being this way? One way to give away the central theme. But there's more ways for it to be messy than this. It kind of makes more sense for it to be messy if you put the, the pants here, or here, or here, or here, rather than there's only one place that it really should be, which is neutral. OK, so, so the idea is that then many ways of being messy and only one way of being yeah. the right way, tidy. Okay. But, but you know, uh, speaking of, as the theorist of the group, um, if I think about the laws of physics, if I look at the microscopic laws of physics, uh, I think that, for example, what you learn about in uh, your first physics classes, the laws of Newton and mechanics and things like that, or even the laws we'll talk about later, the laws of quantum mechanics, the laws of uh, very small scale motion, uh, very tiny motion, those laws of motion don't have this, uh, any preferred sense of past and future. If I, if I take the equations and I reverse them, Oh, like this, okay, so if I look at these equations, so these are the laws, for example, uh, in, written, written in a funny way of classical mechanics. But if I take those equations and I reverse them, say I have a particle that starts here, and it's going through space acting under the influence of some forces, and I stop it here, and I reverse the momentum of that particle, but keep playing it forward, then I exactly trace back that same path. So this, I have, so I have a dynamic symmetry here. If I flip t goes to minus t and p goes to minus p, I get exactly the same laws of motion going backward in time as I would have had going forward in time. So there's something profound about this time symmetry. So Andrew, I know we all teach our students that we can put equations on the second, third slide of the talk. It's not, it's not very good for the audience. Uh, but just maybe say this in a similar way, what you're saying is that it's like you're watching a movie and you can press forward, but it's just as fine to press reverse and both of those work just fine. Yeah. So what's cool is that when I watch the movie going backward, you can't tell the difference between that movie and the same movie going forward. Really? Really. Okay. Because as I understand, you've done some experiments to explore this, this topic. Exactly. Well, let me explain. Andrew is a theorist. He doesn't have a laboratory in which to do experiments. So, Very sad. When he wants to do experiments, his only recourse is to go down to the pool hall with the help of his students to, um, to do some experiments down there. So what did you do? Exactly. So, so I, was, I was sitting at the Perimeter Institute in Canada, which Jeff had invited me to. And I grabbed a couple of my students and I said, let's go do some experiments. And so I made them record me as I was rolling pool balls around. So let's see what happens when I roll these pool balls around. Okay, so there's a pool ball. So we have a little game for you. And the game is, uh, did I play the movie backward or forward? Okay, I'll show it to you again. Pay attention this time. So there's one movie that I just made. And here's another movie that I made. Now, you guess which is the forward movie and which is the backward movie. Northern Hemisphere Southern Hemisphere. Perimeter Institute. Northern Hemisphere. Northern Hemisphere. Where were you? I was the one rolling the balls. Okay. <laughs> Any guesses here? Or is it impossible to tell? What do you think? Oh, it's, we, we, we made the movies silent movies. Okay. These are like old timey movies. You can see color, but no sound. Yeah, correct. Okay. Can we get the, the digital file and look at the printer? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just do, I'll tell you the answer. It turns out that uh, this one over here is a four movie, and this one here is the back. But the fact you couldn't tell, that's the f main point. You couldn't tell, really. Uh, unless maybe if you were super sneaky and look for a very slight slowing down of the ball doing to some friction effects that will sort of come back to a little bit. But that's the profound principle, that you can't tell if I play the movie backward that it's really a backward movie. Okay, but this is maybe too simple. There's only one pool ball. Okay. So what happens if you have two? Oh, okay, let's 
let's see. Okay, so here's another smoothie. Now what? Okay. How could you tell? Uh, because when you put it first, uh, like, kind of hard to explain, but like, it, it skewed down a little bit after, but then it started getting faster. Yeah. And that's what was happening to the first one. This is what Andrew mentioned about this pesky friction that's taking place. You have to look really carefully to see which ones are sort of slowing down, which ones are speeding up. But in the true nature of the collision, it's actually impossible to tell which one is. But, but Peter, um, what if we keep playing this game? Okay. What if we decide to, instead of just playing with one or two pool balls, oh, we have a three ball collision? Okay, now which way is forward and back? It's still pretty hard to tell, isn't it? Any guesses? So, so what you so I made this super sneaky because I made two of the balls rolling as the third one hit it, which you wouldn't ordinarily see. So this made it a little bit more tricky to figure out. But but the trend is the more pool balls I'm adding to this story, the easier it's getting to tell. So what if I did something like what happens when we play the beginning game of pool? What do we do? We put them all together and we have a break. Compare that to the clearly backwards movie. Which looks quite absurd, do you agree? So so what's amazing is that that backward movie is if we again if we ignore the friction aspect of it, is completely in accordance with Newton's laws of physics. That's perfectly describable as a possible forward movie, but we never see that happen. And the reason we never see that happening is because we have uh, something that we like to call an arrow of time in statistical physics. Now, that's kind of fancy, so why don't you explain a little bit more what that means, Gator? Well, I think this goes back to the way my son's room looks at the end of the day. That there's so many ways for the, the ball to be spread around the table after the break that there's only one way to properly wrap the fuel. Pool balls is a definition. So, sort of this, there's so many disordered states allowed here, it's actually much more likely to make a transition from order to disorder. But I think there's a problem with this analysis, Andrew. What's that, Peter? And the problem is, well, if you look at these pool balls, and you look really closely, they're actually made up of atoms and molecules. Yeah. And the type of physics that describes these microscopic particles is totally different than the classical physics we're talking about. It's that quantum physics. So what about quantum physics? Maybe that breaks the whole thing. Yeah, so maybe the story is completely different in quantum physics. So what's the story there? OK, so, so we can, so coming, coming back to my role as the theorist here, I can then write down some fancy equations that describe how the laws of physics look in quantum mechanics, which have some different sets of symbols but the basic idea that I gave before with the Newton's laws, with the idea of the particle and the forces and then reversing momenta and having that trajectory go backward, that same idea applies in exactly the same way to the laws of quantum physics as well. So if I take this basic equation that tells me how a new object in, in quantum mechanics we call the wave function, how that evolves in time, and again, I take time goes to minus time, and I do some other transformation, just like p went to minus p before. I do something like psi goes to psi star in the position representation, some technical stuff. But the point is, is that once I do this discrete set of transformations, lo and behold, I get exactly back to the original uh, equation of motion I had for the forward end. So this time versatility, it works exactly the same way for quantum mechanics as it does for classical physics. Okay, I think I believe you. I mean, I've been impressed by these equations uh, that you've shown. So it's the same. You say you play the movie forward, you play the movie backwards. It works the same in both directions. But there's something else about quantum mechanics I've heard, which is about measurement. And I've heard that in quantum mechanics, measurement is really fundamentally different than it is in, in classical physics. It's not like measuring my weight and so forth with one of these measuring tapes. But I've heard that in quantum 
mechanics of this thing called the quantum superposition. Huh? And when you measure quantum superposition, you get something peculiar happening. It's called a wave function collapse. It's a very dramatic effect. This happens all the time in St. Louis, where I'm from. You see the arc of it. <laughs> and this wave function collapse, that seems like that, that doesn't seem very reversible to me. No, it looks pretty dramatic. So this measurement part seems fundamentally asymmetric. You told us that, okay, fine, the quantum dynamics, well, how it evolves, follows a short term equation. But what about when you measure it? Do you think that it's true that it follows a short term equation? What goes on there? Yeah, so what's weird, as you say, is that if our, when we measure the system, all bets are off in the sense that we have a different set of rules. So if I have, if I try to apply the Schrodinger equation to this measurement, it simply doesn't work. Uh, and furthermore, uh, I have something interesting that happens, is that when I make measurements on my quantum system, I get results that are fundamentally random, that I can prepare exactly for the same initial condition, and to the best that our instruments can tell us, that gives rise to different final results, okay, which is really kind of the crazy thing about quantum mechanics. And so this gives some kind of asymmetry between past and futures. So in the past, uh, you know, we have some, say, a superposition of states I don't know, but then when I make a measurement, suddenly I know for sure what it is, and so this gives some seemingly fundamental asymmetry between past and future. And in fact, if you read the, some of the great physicists and philosophers of physics, some of them will point to this measurement or this wave function collapse as the fundamental origin of asymmetry, where time asymmetry comes from in physics. That sounds pretty amazing. So we actually had this conversation like three years ago, and it motivated uh, some experiments we've been trying to do in the laboratory. So let me take you down to the laboratory to help think about what the experiments we're going to do look like to understand exactly this asymmetry. So, so I can write equations on paper all day long, but, pa but what does it have to do with reality? So Cater's going to come check for us in his laboratory and see what does reality teach us about its nature. Okay, so this is a picture of my part of my laboratory and I've lots of cables and expensive equipment. And back here is this thing called the dilution refrigerator. It's a machine I use to cool my experiments down to temperature just a hair's breadth about absolute zero. And the look inside this dilution refrigerator, there's many layers of shielding, it's all very beautifully gold plated. Go inside this even deeper into the shielding, and eventually I get to a small box. It's an aluminum box, and it, should I just show you half of it here? And sitting in this box is a tiny circuit that I fabricated out of aluminum, which is a superconductor at low temperature. Tiny superconducting circuit. And the end of all this hard work, what I end up with is two quantum energy levels in a box. So two energy levels in a box. This is the system that I'm going to use to do experiments. So let me get this straight here. You've got this really cold thing. It's isolated from everything else. It's vacuum sealed. There's no light around. Everything is perfectly by itself, cold, dark, alone. And you've got a box with an energy level, some energy levels in it, and we're going to experiment on energy. That's right. And the thing is, is these energy levels are going to be just like the kind of energy levels you have in regular atoms, even though it's made out of a circuit. So if you know, prototypical quantum system is a hydrogen atom, one proton, one electron. And one thing we know about hydrogen is that the electron is bound in the hydrogen atom to the, the proton in certain orbitals, certain energy levels. When we look at the light emitted from this, we actually see only a very specific colored light coming off of it, indicating that they're individual energy levels. And that's exactly what we're creating with this heavily shielded, very low temperature box with a circuit and all these stuff. So, so if I've got a gas of hydrogen atoms sitting on my desk and I excite it with some, say, electricity, and look at the light coming out, you're saying I, light only comes out at those certain colors, the very sharp lines of color. That's right. That's what we see. Okay. And why is that again? Why does it come out those sharp lines? Because the, the energy of the system is only allowed to take certain energy levels. It could be this energy, or this energy, or this energy. And when the, the atom makes a transition from one energy to a, a, another, there's an exact amount of energy that it gives up. And that energy, as we'll talk about later, leaves those photons with specific 
wavelengths, different colors. But the point I want to emphasize through all this is at the end of the day, to understand our experiments, all we need to think of is energy levels in a box. That's really what we have at the core of the experiment. And let me just start by telling you some, about, some things about the basic rules of how these quantum levels in a box behave. And I want to do this with an analogy, which is just uh, that of a ball in a box. Okay, so the ball represents what energy state the circuit is in. And it can be in the lower energy state, the lower shelf, or it can be in the upper shelf, so it's a higher energy state. Okay. Now I'm going to let you look inside the box, but really, we sealed it up, it's down in the dark in the bottom of our fridge, so you can't look inside the box directly to see what, what shelf it's on, but we're going to kind of imagine what's going on. Okay. So here's kind of the peculiar rules of quantum mechanics as it applies to the, this ball in a box analogy. So say we start with the ball on the bottom of the shelf of the box, and we send in a pulse of energy. And if the pulse of energy is just the right height, and just the right length, what we find is that the ball always ends up on the top shelf. That is, you put it on the bottom shelf, do the experiment, open it up, and it's on the top shelf. And that happens 100% of the time. Furthermore, we start with the ball on the top shelf, we apply the same pulse of energy, we find that ah, it goes to the bottom shelf, 100% of the time. Yeah. Okay. Now, third thing is kind of what's most interesting. If I send in a half pulse, and I don't mean a pulse that has this funny shape like this, it just has half the amplitude, or it lasts half as long of that first one, okay. you may think, well, hey, it works half the time. And in fact, that's what we see, is that when we put the ball on the bottom shelf, send in half pulse, open it up, but uh, half the time it's on the top, half the time it's on the bottom. It didn't get cut in half, that's just my way of representing that 50% of the time you find it on the bottom, 50% of the time you find it on the top. So, so it's just sort of an inadequate pulse, it only does half the job. Yeah, so you might think it's an inadequate pulse, uh, only doing half the job, it works half the time. The pulse. Turns out that something uh, much more amazing is happening here. And I can explain that to you by thinking about what happens if I send in uh, two half pulses. So what do you think would happen if I send in two half pulses? If they're just sort of half pulses that work half the time. Yeah? Kind of like flipping a coin. First time I get a 50% chance, I can kind of trick those. <laughs> the second time I get a 50% chance of it working. So, so what would it tell me? We'd expect, ah, okay, the first time, we have a 50% chance of it setting to the top shelf, like that. Second one, if it's on the top shelf, there's a 50% chance of it going to the bottom shelf. On the bottom shelf, is a fifty percent chance to go into the top shelf. So actually, we expect that the second pulse has no effect. Right? Does that make sense? So if two shoddy pulses in a row make again a shoddy pulse. Shoddy pulse. Got it. Okay. It turns out that that's completely wrong. What? That's not both. Okay. Turns out that two halves equal the whole. Okay. So if I send in these two half pulses. We find that it moves to the top shelf 100% of the time. And if you think about that, that it tells something really strange about this system. It's that somehow, somehow it remembers that the previous pulse came through. The best way to think about it, I think, is that really there's some sort of shelf in between the two shelves, a stable shelf where it can sit, holding on to the half pulse, being ready to put the rest of the way to the top shelf. Now, wait a minute, Gator. You're pulling a fast one on this because you already told us that there are only two shelves. So now you're introducing the sneaky third shelf in the middle. So what gives? There are only two shelves. So it turns out this sneaky shelf in the middle is actually what we call a quantum superposition. This is exactly what that is. It's some sort of oh, good luck. Let me draw it here. Some sort of combination of the top shelf and the bottom shelf. So when I send in this uh, first pulse, it sits here and it's in a specific state that's the top shelf and the bottom shelf at the same time. And then, for example, I send in a different pulse, like a quarter pulse or a three quarter pulse or a minus a half pulse. I can have all sorts of different synthesis, an infinite number of possibilities. Any kind of combination of top and bottom that I like. Okay. And as physicists like to give this fancy name, we give it a discrete letter psi, call it a wave function. 
And so this is what we call this coherent superposition. So the way we write it is with this funny rocket notation. So this symbol here just means that's the state of reality with that ball being on the top shelf. And this is some state of reality with that ball being on the bottom shelf. And quantum mechanics says, I don't have to be in just one shelf or the other. I can, in some sense, be in both at the same time. And these numbers, alpha, beta, these are just some numbers sitting out front. This tells the relative fraction of the time we'll find it either in the bottom shelf or the top shelf when we come and look at it or measure it. That's right. So here's a really nice uh, example of that type of superposition that you can see with your naked eye. So here I have a drawing of a box, right? And I can ask you, does the box sort of face down to the right, down to the left, or up to the right? To the right. Can we put it this box of drawn in blue? Or is it this box of drawn in red? But you see that both possibilities exist at once in this drawing. But when we look at it, we see it as a box, we kind of forced to be one or the other. This is a really good analogy for what happens when one measures uh, the ball in the box or looks at this box and finds out it's pointing up or it's pointing down. It's two things at once, and now it has to be one or the other. So I know uh, I certainly have a fondness for boxes. What about you, Cater? I do too. Physicists love boxes. Boxes are great. Uh, also, we have the ball in the box. We have just the box, and we're facing up to the right or down to the left. Uh, and then there's, of course, the famous Schrodinger's cat. Oh my god, what have you done, Cater? You snuck a cat into this box. So this is a classic thought experiment meant to illustrate how strange this process of measurement is. And here's the, the apparatus. So there's a cat in a box. And the cat is sitting next to some vial of poison. Okay. And the vial of poison has the opportunity to be smashed by a hammer. And the hammer is triggered uh, by the decay of a radioactive atom. So let me tell you what happens. We put the cat in the box, the cat stays alive, happy cat. And then we wait for the atom to decay. If the atom decays, it triggers the, the hammer to smash the poison, which then kills the cat. So you can think, what happens if I put this cat in a box and I wait the right amount of time, so there's a 50% probability that the atom has decayed, in which case the cat is dead, or there's 50% probability that the atom has not decayed, in which case the cat is still alive. Because the, the, the atom is quantum mechanical, really the right conclusion is that the cat is both alive and dead at the same time. It's in a superposition of both at once. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, I've it's never pretty, seen a half alive, half dead cat before. That's that's strange because when you look in a box, just like the ball up on the shelves, it has to be one or the other. There are no zombie cats, fortunately, wandering around. Uh, so the act of opening the box really forces the cat to to stay the same. It has to be either alive or dead. And this is something that that troubled Einstein. So, so Einstein, he didn't like this at all. He was very deeply disturbed by this. He said, reality should be reality. There should be some reality. We should be able to describe it. And maybe we don't are not able to adequately describe it. Maybe we have some intrinsic uh, uncertainty in our instruments, or there's some way that the reality masks itself from us. But he couldn't believe that God would play dice with the universe, that there would be somehow intrinsic randomness woven into the fabric of reality. But that's the way it seems to be. That would make open the box and suddenly change the cat. It's either dead or alive. Hard to know what's going to happen. It's possible to know what will happen when you open the box. And that's the weird thing about quantum mechanics. Is that we can't predict what's going to happen. So in all other branches of science that are precise branches, we're able to predict what's going to happen. We, you give us some inputs, we predict the outputs, the outputs happen. But in quantum mechanics, we can't do that. We can just tell you the odds of what's going to happen, which makes quantum mechanics different than other aspects of physics. But, I mean, is it possible that just because we're opening the box too fast, or can, can, is there some way to do this more gently, to 
yeah. to peek inside the box. What if we just we peeked peek inside the, the box? So we didn't really like, you know, stare boldly at the cat, but just uh, winked at it or something. What would happen? So I'm an experiment. Let's think about how we could do this. We could take our box and we could drill a little hole in it, right? Over here. Drill a hole in the box, and we can shine a little bit of light into the box with the laser, because of course lasers are really cool. That's how you do experiments. And we'll see if we can just send a little bit of light into the box to learn about whether or not it's on the top shelf or the bottom shelf. Because we won't use cats, it's not very nice. The cat will get the ball. I don't think the cats from your dilution fridge would do well. Yeah, they'd be kind of cold. Okay, so we're going to shine this laser uh, into the box. And the first thing I want to ask is, you know, just actually think about where the light from this laser comes from. It actually comes back to these, these quantum energy levels we have. As I said, is when I uh, when you turn on the laser, what's happening is I'm making transitions from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, and emitting a specific amount of energy. This energy has to come out in the form of a particle. It's not so much a wave, but it's a, it's a photon. Particle wave. So the fact that it has a very precise amount of energy, what does that tell you about the properties of this crazy uh, photon, this particle of light you've just been telling us about? Well, it has a very specific, it has a specific color to it, okay? And, um, and it's, a, it's a specific single particle. It's a, it's a quantized level of energy. It's exactly that much energy. It travels along at the speed of time. Okay? So really, when I'm drawing my, my signal here by, by laser, I want to think of it as individual photons that I'm sending in. Again, we're going to peek into the box. We don't want to send in too many photons at once. We're just going to send in a few photons. So, so if I see your laser pointer there, I, I can see it with my naked eye. So how many photons are coming out of that laser pointer? Oh, quite a few. 10 to the 18, 10 to the 20. It's a milliwatt laser. So that's like 10 to the 20. That's like Carl Sagan's billions and billions of photons. There are lots of photons. Yeah. So it's going to be challenging to work in a regime where we send just one or two photons into the box at a time. But that's what we mean by peeking into the box. This is taking the idea of peeking the box to the extreme, one photon at a time. Okay. So let's think about how this, this type of peaking, what can we learn about whether the ball is the top shelf or the bottom shelf when we send the photon in? So. But now, Peter, is this, is this photon you're sending in, is that like the pulse of energy you were sending in before to make the ball, the, 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 uh, the ball in the box go up to the so, top shelf? It's a very good point. So it's a th th different kind of, uh, of, of pulse. And let me, I wouldn't want to, when I send my photon in, to send the exact right amount of energy to excite the ball from the top bottom of the shelf, top shelf. In that some sense, I would be destroying what I want to learn, because now my photons are changing the state of the thing. So in fact, the photons are a different energy than this energy here. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a frequency of light that doesn't really affect whether or not the ball is the top or the bottom. It doesn't, doesn't cause any transitions here. So it doesn't give that ball much energy doesn't give the ball any energy, all it's going to do is it's going to go in and it'll either be reflected, coming back out if it hits the ball, or it'll be transmitted through the deck. Okay. So the way this works is I'll send the light in, and if the, the ball's on the bottom shelf, it maybe blocks some of the light, so I get less light coming through. Okay. And so here's what we do. We send it through, we'll put the ball on the bottom shelf. And we'll measure what we get in the detector. And here's what we see. We see three photons, two photons, one photon, one photon, five photons. It's kind of interesting. The photons are have some sort of fluctuations to them. What's going on with that? So this is like a different time bit, right? Yeah, like so like the first millisecond, I'd get three, and the second millisecond, I'd get two, and so on. And the reason that happens is because these photons aren't all lined up in a row, like school children going into recess or something like that. They're all kind of bunched up randomly, like uh, you find, like uh, you know, like when you're waiting for a bus at the bus stop. The bus is just kind of come at these random times. That's what these photons are doing, and so they have this intrinsic randomness associated with their arrival. Hmm. Okay. So, in any given millisecond, I detect a, a different number of photons. So actually, what I'll plot here is the distribution through the curve. This is how many photons I. I detect, like what's how, what's like, here's the number of detected photons, three, that's the most likely number. But sometimes I detect as many as five photons or as few as zero photons. So I get a distribution of the number of photons that I detect. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so let's see what happens if we put the ball on the top shelf. What we find is now we detect, on average, a higher number of photons. And of course, now it's on the top shelf, it's blocking less of the light, so more light is through. So now we get 5, 4, 2. We can have as many as 8 photons and still as few as 0. But it looks like from your overlapping distributions there that uh, I don't know for sure, based on what I'm detecting, where the ball, the box is. Yeah, that's, that's part of the point of peeking into the box. We're not going to try to learn all at once what's happening. We're saying so few photons, it's hard to know. Is it on top of the bottom? It's actually the, the special sauce of the experiment. So let's actually go back to our thought experiment. Let's say that we have this superposition. That is, the ball is on the top shelf and the bottom shelf at the same time. Okay. And that's what we want to peek in. We want to see what happens when you look at the superposition of cat being a dead and alive at the same time. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll send the photons in and after we create the superposition of two states. And we'll see what the detector says. So let's go through an example. What if the detector said seven? What does that mean? I think it's more likely that it's in the top shelf. If we see the detector says seven, or more likely it's on the bottom shelf. Top shelf. Why is that the case? Yeah, because if that's that's a large number of photons. It's more likely to get seven if it was on the top shelf. So therefore, yeah, you, you think about it this way: that if I was on the bottom shelf, this would be the distribution of the results. And so for to be out here. This is really, really unlikely. I have very, very small fraction of the time that it would happen if I were in blue. And even though it's still small with red, it's still much more likely than I would get with the blue. Isn't there some sort of fancy name for there should be there should be a rule for this kind of thing. Huh. Uh, so, so, <laughs> is, is that Bayes' theorem? That's that's right. That's what they call Bayes' theorem. And so this was developed by Thomas Bayes back in the 1700s. So he was thinking about probability not in the context of quantum mechanics, but in just the context of everyday reasoning about chance. And so he had this idea, which is that what happens if we have two things? Say A, we call it A and B, and A can be something like A is the proposition you're a woman, and B is the proposition that you're pregnant. And what he pointed out is that the conditional probabilities are different. So I can say, what's the probability of being a woman given you're pregnant, or what's the probability of being pregnant given you're a woman? And those are two very different things. And so what Bayes' theorem allows us to do is that it allows us to be able to convert back and forth between those kind of conditions with this rule. So this is the probability of A given B, that's the probability of B given A, and you have to multiply and divide by the probabilities of each proposition separately. Let me take you through an example of, of Bayes' theorem. Through uh, a wonderful web comic uh, called XKCD. The idea is we could ask, we're in this room, the sun is just set. You could say, is it possible that the sun just exploded right when it went below the horizon and it went to su supernova? We can't tell because it's already set. It's nighttime. Uh, so the only way we can tell is with the neutrino detector. The idea is the sun, when it's burning, emits neutrinos. And neutrinos interact very weakly with matter. They come right through the roof of the building during the day, and they come right through the, the earth, through your bed, during the night, coming from the sun. So if you can detect neutrinos, you can tell if the sun is still burning, and then you can know if it's gone supernova or not. So in this uh, hypothetical example, we have a detector that can detect the neutrinos, and it can tell you whether or not the sun has undergone a supernova or not. In reality, there is such a detector. It takes a cubic kilometer of ice, it's in Antarctica, so that way it's compact. But it can tell if the sun is supernova. But this is a very funny detector, because after it detects the neutrino flux from the sun, it rolls two dice. And if it gets double sixes, it's going to lie to us, otherwise it will tell the truth. Kind of strange. So we press the button, and the detector says yes. The sun has undergone a supernova. It's kind of a tricky answer because we don't know for sure if it's lying to us or not. So we have to analyze what it's saying with statistics. Uh, in, 
maybe I can just make the point that even though this, this device has this somewhat strange feature of rolling the dice, every other detector we know of has some possibility of being wrong some fraction of the time. So I think about this also as a big model of that, exactly. of that uh, flaw. So there's two approaches to understanding this statistically. The first is frequentist statistics. This is what we're taught in school. This is um, standard bread and butter statistics. It says ah, the probability of this result happening by chance is 1 in 36. That's the probability of getting double sixes, which is about 2.7%. Okay. Now, 2.7% uh, corresponds to a p-value of less than 0 0.05, which we all agree is a significant result worthy of publication in a high tier journal. So we should include that the sun has just exploded. But the Bayesian statistician has been definitive that so confident uh, that the sun is not under a supernova until like the wage of $50. Yeah. So what is the calculation that this Bayesian statistician did to determine really what the probability of the, is that the sun underwent a supernova? probability of a yes answer given supernova. Okay, what if we actually know what that is? That's the chance that it's not lying to us. So that's uh, 35 out of 36, 97 percent. Okay, so we take that and multiply it by the probability of a supernova. So what's the probability that there was a supernova for our sun in the last 15 minutes? Yeah? Zero. So this is a pretty simple equation, just zero times 97 percent gives us the probability. So this is the this is base rule applied to this. In the case of our ball on the top and the bottom shelf, base rule also provides everything we need to know to know what the probability of being on the top shelf given in photons. Well, that's equal to the probability that's on the top shelf originally. That's fifty percent times this probability of ten photons given the top shelf. Well, that's exactly this distribution that we measured. So just by knowing the distribution, if I know for sure it's either top shelf or bottom shelf, that's enough information for you to now go and do calculations. Right. So let's go through an example of what that looks like. So here's my ball on a shelf. Remember, I can think of any possible superposition state between the two. So I'm just going to replace the drawing of the ball, one place or another, with an arrow that points to where it is. So right now it's pointing to the superposition top and bottom at the same time, but it point up to the top or down to the bottom. So let's see what happens to the, the, the state of the ball and the box as we detect photons. So first we detect six photons. Well, that means it's more likely to be on the top. Then we detect zero photons, more likely to be on the bottom. You can see it's moving around as we detect photons. So, so just going back a step, when you got that six, and then you applied the Bayes rule, and then that basically shifted my, my, I had to change my mind, I had to update my assignment of what this probability of where the photon was, or what the state was, in light of this new information that I gave. Absolutely. So and that's why the arrow points a little bit further to the up, because that's more in line with what I just learned. Exactly. And so then we detect zero photons. Well, that's, although we were pretty sure that maybe it's starting to be on the top shelf, now it's kind of going to cause us to change our mind a little bit, pushing it back to the bottom. Remind me, why does it, why does it getting zero make us change our mind completely? Why don't I why don't I put it all the way down to the bottom? Because it's possible that you could get zero photons if it was on the top shelf. Remember? The distribution allowed well, lots of things to be possible, although it's quite unlikely. So that's why I think, ah, oh, maybe it's down on the bottom shelf. As we go on, we can see each detection conveys a little bit of information about where it is, sort of updating our probabilistic understanding of where it is. So it's a logical word. So 
the idea is that the information we're collecting changes the state of the ball, or you could say the state of the ball is conditioned on the information we what we've learned. So, the, the evolution, what we call the quantum trajectory. And to, to show you that this is really the sort of thing that we do in the lab, here are actually some real, some real data in the lab where we measure these quantum trajectories. So we start here with the top and bottom at the same time, and each one of these colored curves represents one quantum trajectory. So there's one that goes up to the top shelf, here's one that goes down to the bottom shelf, and so forth. Overall color skew, and that shows kind of what happens on average. And so, what you see eventually is that if you keep measuring long enough, you find it's either eventually top shelf or bottom shelf, but it might take you a while to get there. Yeah. But there's something else that's kind of funny that happens. So let me go back to the analogy here. We saw it in this case here. So, we detected six photons, then we detected zero photons. And then we detect zero three photons, and we're actually back to where we started. That's kind of uh, interesting, Cater. Yeah, well, this is actually something that uh, you discovered maybe a while ago. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot. forgot. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Can we see this in the data? Fascinating. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> so you see this in the data that sometimes it kind of wanders around, and after some long time, it's actually back where it started. So you can actually have. Some sort of reversibility in this measurement process. So, so let me let me say that another way. So you can think about this case where you eventually come back to where you start, this blue one. For a while, you learn something about the information. You're learning about something about the state. And that's making you change the state. But then, eventually, you, you kind of unlearn that information. You learn contradictory information that takes that state back to where it was in the beginning. So in some sense, you're uncollapsing the state. Yeah, and collapse the wave function. So here's another way to look at it. You can imagine some uh, trajectory of the ball. So here's the top shelf, here's the bottom shelf. Here's the number of photons, it's a function of time, for example. And you can see, ah, here's one sort of trajectory that ends up on the top shelf. It turns out that in order to, to run this movie backwards, it's possible. All they do is start at this final top shelf, and we have to play exactly the opposite record opposite number of photons back. So we send it in the reverse order with the opposite sign. And that takes me back exactly back to where I started. That's an incredible, Cater, but, but what are the odds that you can get exactly the same uh, squiggly measurement record but played backwards and, and upside down? Oh, well, they're quite quite low. But this really this is a this is a, a game of is it possible to do this? So we can think about Here's what we measured, but is it physically possible to see this movie in reverse? And what this tells me is, yeah, I can, just like this. So here's another way of thinking about it. If I didn't tell you, like, we played the movies before with the, with the pool balls, I played you the forward movie and the backward movie, and guess, asked you to guess which is which. Is which. And if I showed you that this is a movie and asked, is this forward and this is backward, because there's blue lines, it's just some random fluctuating noise, you have no way to know which one is going to be the proper forward one and which one's going to be the proper pattern. It's just some squiggly line, right? Right. So reversing, you know, so, so flipping it and reversing it, to you it just looks like some noisy <laughs> kind of signal, right? Yeah. But it turns out that we can actually analyze what the probability of one being forward versus backward is. We'll get to that. But this is exactly, as you pointed out here, this is exactly analogous to like when we had these equations before, flipping t to minus t and p to minus p. This is the condition in which to be able to run this movie backwards in time. Yeah, and this, this also works even if we drive the system at the same time. So it shows you that we can do these pulses to bring it from the top to the bottom, the bottom to the top. Uh, and if we add these pulses at the same time that we're making the measurement, you can still do this reversal. So we can have dynamics and we can have measurement at the same time. It takes this very beautiful curve, making its way forward, but it also works just as fine going in reverse. So this shows something very profound, that this error of time, this time reversibility anyway, uh, is again restored even in the presence of measurement. So we thought we had this hypothesis before that measurement must destroy this time reversibility. In fact, what we see is it's not true. That we can, in fact, time reverse this continuous 
or the, the sequence of, of measurements happening uh, in some period of time. Yeah, so it's actually very similar to what you showed us with the pool hall experiments. That uh, although these, the, the dynamics can be reversed, so when we can look at these images, we can see, or the movies, and we can guess probabilistically, well, I know which one is going forward, I know which one is going backward. We can make a probabilistic statement which one is going forward. Exactly. So, so these, there are two questions here. So the first question has to do with, can I reverse this quantum measure process? And then the second question is, how probable is it that I can do that? So that's just like the pool, these, these pool examples. So just like I told you that this time reverse break is possible according to Newtonian laws, statistical arguments you can give, say, because I'm going from some, say, well-defined, like, like Cater's son's bedroom, a well-defined ordered state to a disordered state, that increase of entropy is what gives rise to the so-called statistical error of time, where I make a, be a best guess about which way time is flowing. So let's think about how we can assign a probability to a single movie that we're watching. Think about which one's more likely to be going forward versus backward. This actually gives us a deeper look into how the measurement works itself. So remember the situation here where the ball is on the top shelf and the bottom shelf at the same time, playing off to the side like this. The probability of detecting uh, a certain number of photons is given by the sum of these two distributions. That is, it's equally likely to be on the top shelf, which would give you this red distribution, or on the bottom shelf, which gives you the blue distribution. So I really just add the two together, uh, which gives me one sort of slightly broader distribution. So let's say we detect a specific number of photons, for example, six photons. Well, that means it's slightly more likely to be on the top shelf. Okay? So now, it's actually going to be more likely that we'll detect more photons. That is, now, it's more likely to top shelf, so it's more likely to detect photons drawn from this red distribution, which in effect shifts this distribution over a little bit to the right. Okay, so you can also think about what the probability of each detection is. That first one happens with some probability, the second one happens with some probability. So by multiplying these probabilities together, we get a total probability for a given movie that we watch. So let me give you an example of a particularly likely trajectory. Let's say, for example, we detect our six photons to start with and cause the distribution to move over slightly. And then we detect roughly six photons again, maybe five photons. Well, that's quite likely a result. But again, that reinforces what we already knew, since it's a large number of photons. But pushes it even further towards the, uh, the top shelf, moving the distribution over even further, and again, Again, the most likely result continues to reinforce what we already started to know. To run this process in reverse is actually quite unlikely. Because now we have to get results that kind of disagree with what we, what we, what we, what we know. We have to get a very small number of photons, but you can see that's very unlikely. So it's going to happen with a very small probability. But ultimately, it is possible for it to reverse its process. It's just less likely than forward probability. So even though you can uncollapse the wave function, the more and more you collapse it, the more unlikely it is that you can uncollapse it. Right. And this comes back to the idea that there's many ways to be messy and one way to be clean. It's much more likely to be going this forward way, collapsing the wave function, than to have the reverse process where we uncollapse it. Very similar. But in a way, it's kind of backwards, though, right? Because with the, uh, with, uh, with the uh, wave function example, we're all going to a unique state, or let's say, let's say the, the shelf states, right? Whereas with West's room, you're going to the maximally dirty state. And so in some sense, the reason it's reversed is because I'm learning more and more. So it's sort of like I'm doing more and more cleaning. So the more cleaning I do, the more unlikely it is that his room remains messy. <laughs> so let's look at some uh, one more, a couple more examples from, from the experiment. So say I take one of these these movies I watched, and I can assign a half probability for this thing, but some type of probability that's I'll call p forward. And then I show you that it's perfectly possible to have the reverse process where I start 
here up near the top shelf, and they get results that are quite unlikely in some sense that cause us to reverse all the way back to where it started, the combination of polymer and the bottle at the same time. So we have, have it's possible that these probabilities are in general quite different. In fact, this one in general is much more likely to do something. So here's a, a graph that, that shows exactly what we expect to see. So what does this graph show us? So remember we told you about we want to distinguish between the, the, the this given record that I showed you, the guessing game. You're gonna you're gonna give a guess that this one movie is the forward. Another guess that the other movie is the backward. So we can actually calculate with our best statistical theory what those probabilities are. And then what we can do is we can essentially compare those probabilities to each other. Okay? And so we make it so that uh, if, if the probabilities are the same, we assign that's a value of zero. If the probability of forward is bigger than the probability that's backward, then we assign that a number bigger than zero. And if the backward probability seems to be bigger than the forward probability, we assign that uh, a number uh, less than zero. And so what we do is we do a bunch of experiments now. Uh, we do make a bunch of movies, and for each one of these, we calculate this number that tells us, is the movie more likely running forward or backward, and give it a continuous number, and then simply histogram all that data to give this plot. Okay, so what I see here is, uh, the center of this distribution is centered at some positive value, which means all of this area here, which since I'm colorblind, you can tell me that it's uh, yellow. Yellow, okay? The, all this yellow part here corresponds to cases where it's more likely that the movie is played forward than backward. And it's only off in this orange corner, red, I don't know what color it is. Orangey red. Orangey red corner that, that, that it's more likely that they'll be going backward. So it's possible that movies that are more likely to be going backwards, but that doesn't happen as often as the whites, where it's more likely they'll be going forward. And, and so what happens when if I play the movie for a longer period of time, if I have really long movies? And so keep, this thing keeps shifting over and over and over again to the right, because it's more and more, less and less likely that you could have the reverse. Essentially because the, the measurement record has to somehow disagree with the state of the system. It has to have some anomalously large fluctuation in order to get what you want, this time reversed movement. Right, so you can see that in one of these examples. So here's an example of a trajectory that uh, has a very, uh, it's much more likely to be going forward than backward. Movies are more likely forward than backward. And you can see, okay, it's pushed down to the bottom shelf. And you can see the number of photons is always very low. Okay, so these sort of, the, the, the trajectory and the record the number of photons tend, tend to agree with one another. Uh, one of these ones over here, where it seems to be going backwards, kind of shows the opposite effect. Here it's up on the top shelf, but we start detecting a very small number of photons, okay, which causes it to sort of change the, our mind, or what's stated in, causing it to go in reverse. So here's one that's kind of backwards in time. So we, that we tend to observe, not very often, but every once in a while, and here's a forward in time one. So that kind of blows my mind here. So you're saying that in your lab, you take this data, and this is forward in time data, but if I use my best physical theory to make my best guess on this example, it'll tell me time is running backward. That's, that's essentially what you would, if you had to bet money on it, that's what you would choose. Yeah. That's amazing. So uh, let's summarize what we've learned in this, this last hour of this talk. Uh, so you told us a bit. Classical physics is time reversible. Remember, you showed us these equations. You said, ah, oh, you take this thing and plug it into that thing, and it's as if the movies are played, uh, uh, played forward or backward. So indeed, it's time reversible, except when it's not. So we showed in this example with the pool balls that we can tell the direction of time by the statistical argument that we tend to see the pool breaking into many different balls. We don't see the unbreak physics happening, even though it's allowable by the classical mechanics. It's statistically very unlikely. Okay. So something about this transition from order to disorder allows us to tell which way time is going. We call that the thermodynamic arrow of time. So you've also talked about how uh, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum, sorry, quantum physics is time reversible. That's true, except when it's not. 
And we talked about wave function collapse and how that breaks this time reversibility. That, uh, that we have this uh, measurement that's random and we get a definite result and that means I know the, 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 the present for sure. I know what happened just in the past. But I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But didn't we realize that this type of wave function collapse is too abrupt. You cut a tiny hole inside of the box and just kicked in to sort of slowly learn about what's going on. We found in that case, this quantum measurement can be time reversible. That is, you can have some sort of situation where it's perfectly fine to play the movie backward or forward. And that's also true, except when it's not. Or let me say a little bit more. When we break that, but nevertheless, just like the, the case with pool halls, we can tell the difference again from, from the past to the future and the future to the past by making a statistical argument and saying which of these two movies is most likely to be true uh, using a, uh, a guessing game uh, based on what we know about the physics of this process. So in one case, the classical case, we can tell the arrow of time by transitioning from order to disorder. In the quantum case, we can tell the arrow of time. So in this case, we transition from disorder to order. So an asymmetry and a symmetry are the same. With that, I think it's time to thank our uh, wonderful collaborators who contribute to this, this, this work. Yeah, we work with wonderful people. So we've got great people in Cater's lab, as well as uh, Alexander Brockhoff, Maria Chantastri, and, and Justin Dressel. Uh, uh, wonderful collaborators. Yeah, and uh, thank you all for your attention. We'll be happy to have it. Okay, any questions? Uh, Kelvin. Thanks, that was really interesting. Um, so I found this stuff about the possibility of measurement reversal uh, quite interesting, but I'm just struggling a little bit to see the connection between this and the arrow of time. Um, so as I understood the argument, you, you, you began with an argument for why the laws of nature, whether we're talking about classical or quantum physics, the laws of nature uh, don't have a built-in arrow of time, they're not time symmetric. And then, so if we can't find the arrow of time at the fundamental level, we look for some inversion behavior, perhaps described by the second law of thermodynamics. I guess I was a little bit puzzled just by the first move. So if I understood the argument, the argument was uh, the dynamical equations of motion are time symmetric, therefore the laws of nature are time symmetric. Uh, if that was the argument, that, that didn't quite seem valid to me. Um, what we can infer from the time symmetric nature of the equations of motion is that for any given uh, physically possible process, there is a corresponding physical possibility where that process goes in reverse. Um, now that doesn't quite get you no fundamental arrow of time, because you can imagine a possible world that has a fundamental arrow of time. But it's also the case that for any physically possible event, there is another corresponding physically possible event, which is the first one in reverse. Now, in that universe, we would say the equations of motion are time symmetric, but the laws of nature um, are time asymmetric. So it's how do we get that first step going where, where we get the laws of nature not being time symmetric? You want to take this one? Sorry, <laughs> yeah, take that one. That is, this is the great thing of having two speakers. Is like, <laughs> you can think about a good answer. <laughs> so I, I agree that okay, the dynamical equations of motion you can see a time symmetric. And then I think the question is, what where do you what do you call the laws of nature? Do they encompass the emergent behavior or the probabilistic statements we can make looking at the data? So I think what we're saying in the talk is the fundamental uh, equations of motion are time symmetric. The the action of how the weak measurement of peaking in the box is is itself is time reversible, also reverse it. But there's an emergent behavior of probabilistic error of time that emerges when we think about what the, the likelihood of a forward would be versus a backward. And so if that emergent behavior, which I think would also encompass the second law, is what you really call the laws of nature, then I think we, there's an error of time in the law of nature. Is that yeah, let me take a slightly different uh, angle on this. So I think what you're driving at, Calvin, is that, is that the way you frame the question 
if you have, again, this property I talked about, where if I, if I flip the sign of the time, the equations are exactly the same, that means the, 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 the equations of motion are time reversal invariant, but you're thinking about a world in which, say, uh, you know, you have one process, like, like in my example with the pool ball, you have the pool ball running, rolling from right to left, and another example where the pool ball was rolling from left to right. So there, there was no preferred direction. There wasn't any particular reason why I should have more likely started from the left than the right. But I think you're talking about a world in which, say, there was this intrinsic asymmetry that balls just tended to come from the left more often than they came from the right. Am I getting your, your, your question correctly? Uh, yes, and in, in that world, the, the equations will also be time symmetric. Exactly. So if, so if there were some intrinsic other rules of the universe that pool balls only came from the left, then indeed that would break the time reversal symmetry uh, simply by breaking the the uh, boundary condition symmetry. Yeah, is there some reason why our world is not like that? That's really the question. Yeah, so I guess we didn't address that question, but, but it is a uh, interesting one. But I, I'm particularly interested in questions from young people and non-experts, too. <laughs> Are there any young people in the audience? <laughs> okay, guys, come on. Uh, yeah, I think that guy should know. Oh, he's great, go. Oh, yeah, okay, go ahead. You know, sir, go ahead. Oh, so, uh, my question is uh, that do you ever think that sometime in the future we'll ever have instruments that will be able to measure like more precisely or the most precise than like what, what we have right now? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so this is something that Andrew and I are both passionate about. It's how you measure things. Um, and as we see in this talk, quantum mechanics and quantum measurement involves noise and randomness. When we send photons, my favorite, the best way to measure anything is by shining laser light on it. That's how I do everything. Um, but the laser light itself has quantum noise, and so you have to ask the question, Given the constraints of quantum mechanics, what is the best you can do to measure something? One of the really exciting things is that sometimes quantum mechanics actually allows you to measure something way better than you thought was possible before. So we're actually entering an era where quantum tricks, quantum entanglement, uh, are harnessed to, to, to push measurements uh, to, to new frontiers. I mean, this is actually going to drive huge advances in, for example, the LIGO laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory, which detects gravitational waves, they're going to start using really sophisticated quantum tricks to make the sensor much more sensitive and build look deeper into space. So that's something that many of us are looking for. Yeah, so let me give you another example. Uh, so you asked about you know, building better sensors. So one, one of this, you get to say, what do you want to sense, right? Well, what are the things you want to sense? And so one of the best things that I love the best about sensing is time. You talk about take the arrow of time, time is a great thing. So so what about how do you measure time? With a clock. You measure time with a clock. I love it. And so uh, so what's one of the ways you might do it? So you might go to your grandfather's clock and see how many times the pendulum goes back and forth. And that's a magic way of counting how many seconds have ever passed, right? And so you could say, well, well you love grandfather's clock, and it's wonderful. But maybe there's a way of doing it more precisely. So, for example, after 30 years, your grandfather clock might lose a few, a few seconds. And so how would you do better? So is there some way you could use quantum tricks, or, for example? So what's, so what's our best clock today? It's not our grandfather's clock, but it's actually something using atoms. So it's using the atomic world to be able to more precisely measure time by measuring uh, some periodic signal, the frequency. Okay? So by using, so by developing these new techniques, so that's one of the things Kater and I work on a lot, is thinking about how can we use the special features of quantum mechanics, because they obey a different set of laws than classical physics, how can we take advantage of those special features to make better clocks, to make better magnetic field sensors, electric field sensors, uh, all kinds of things. What else, what else are we thinking about? So we're thinking about measuring frequency very precisely, we're maybe talking about, about optical things, like optical tilt angles and optical frequencies and all kinds of things. So, so that's something we're very passionate about and I think we have a lot of hope that science will continue to teach us new, new things to do in that direction. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. They're gonna, their work is going to allow them to see brand new things that people have never seen before. So it's really very exciting for pretty much everybody.
I mean, Aaron, I think you had a question, right? Yes, so um, from the perspective of a naive undergraduate, um, it seems like, you know, you, you, were, you were talking about the, the symmetry of the equations of motion and that sort of unitary evolution is, is going to be type symmetric. Um, and then you introduced measurement, which is stochastic and not unitary. But you, you then talked about your looking at trajectories in, um, in doing the, the, the playing, playing the, the movie backwards where the trajectory would go to a coherent superposition purely from measurements. And it, it sounds almost like that could be a way of replacing unitary evolution with a completely stochastic picture. Is that absurdly naive of, of, of an undergraduate to say, or it is, uh, what? what? Uh, so, so first of all, not, not at all. It's not naive at all, it's a good question. Um, so, so one thing you can think about it is that uh, the, the Schrodinger type evolution will take, say, a given state A to a given state B in a certain amount of time. And so what, what, we, what we see with the measurements is that this provides another way of taking the state from state A to some other state B, but the, only, the main difference is, is that we can't guarantee it's going to get to this particular state B because the outcomes we need to get it from A to B turn out to be random. And so depending on this particular trajectory, if I did the same experiment that got me from A to B at one time, I did it again, it might take me over here to state C. Okay? So that's one difference, but, but, that, but, that sense, but that sense of using the measurement to kind of control the state and make it go to a certain point where you want it to go, like, like a Schrodinger evolution or unitary evolution would, that's exactly right. And this is sometimes another way of having control uh, over the quantum system. Did you want to add anything, Peter? So there's some very nice experiments recently where an experimental group is able to take what they're measuring and not just measure is it on top or the bottom shelf, but to actually to move that around and say, is it on this company combination shelf at some weird angle? And so they can measure something else and they can actually move where they're measuring and Andrew's done a lot of work in this, which is also participated in this bit. Um, they're able to, to sort of measure it, but move where they're measuring and kind of drag the state around. It's called xeno dragging. So it's a new way to control what state is in by sort of dragging what you're what you're looking at. So it's a it's a new new opportunity for controlling quantum evolution. Uh, Peter, I have a question. Um, regardless of what classical physics and quantum physics and in this book, they seem to be really related in a forest uh, arrow of time, but I'm curious uh, so a relativistic quantum mechanics, are there experiments or measurements that change anything with this, like the further, for example, time, I think that as you get the closer speed of light, the light is slowing down, so for the photon, that's cost of being zero, right? Is there an error of time for photons, or is there something observable about photons experiencing time differently that can only be explained in quantum mechanics, or not this is quantum This is a question I always get asked. Photon is going to see the light, so what happens with time dilation? And I don't know the answer, so maybe the answer is good. To shed some light on that. So, so good. Uh, so, so one of the things you can do when you write down relativistic, so, 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 you don't, so for, let, let's back up a step. So we have a certain set of physics, classical physics, Newtonian physics, that describe how balls move under the influence of forces. Quantum mechanics describes the physics for the very small things. There's a sort of a different extension of the physical laws that happen when I start moving very fast. So if I start accelerating my particle, I move it close to the speed of light, some fraction of the speed of light, then I have to have a new set of laws that come into play that describe that. And that was discovered by Albert Einstein. It's called the theory of relativity. So what's interesting about those set of laws is, they, is, is, is that they mix our notions of space and time. I can't just talk about space separately from time. I talk about space time together as one thing. And then what I can do is I can make transformations from one, say, one observer that's sitting on Earth to another observer that's sitting in a, 
uh, in a spaceship going you know, hundreds of miles an hour away from me, or, uh, you know, you know, tens of thousands of miles an hour, or whatever. And and what we see is that is that the, the, the notions of space and time are going to be different for those different observers. Suddenly, we can then further extend that theory to also account for the very small, and that and that is called relativistic quantum mechanics, which then leads to uh, other theories of of, of uh, physics. And so, uh, so, so that that theory, so the theory of relativistic quantum mechanics, has its own symmetries. And furthermore, you can go to you can go to you know, relativistic field theory, which is a mini body theory of that. And there are certain discrete symmetries. So, so, so time reversal symmetry also applies. You can think about doing an experiment where you have particles that scatter. So, I send in particles that scatter from the, from the distance. They make some scattering process. They come out. They go into the detector. And you can describe that formally with quantum mechanical uh, formalism, and you find that, that, that generally you'll have some time reversal symmetry. There are some cases where that's broken, and there are other symmetries like parity reversal and charge conjugation, and so these different combinations of symmetries can be broken or preserved in certain situations. Let me say generally, I think this idea, these ideas of measurement that we've been developing uh, quite strongly uh, and have applied in, in labs like Hater's, this idea is basically almost unknown in the high energy or the relativistic quantum mechanics community. I don't think, like I've talked to string theory friends or, or people that work in high energy physics, they don't know any of this kind of physics at all. So I think the answer is we simply don't know uh, how, how these ideas generalize to, to relativistic quantum physics, what kind of experiments you can do there. Uh, I think it's really a wide open area. And so let me just say that, that for the young people in the audience, there's lots of work to do here. And so uh, this is a recruitment talk for you to come and uh, dive right in and, and figure this out. Yeah, that's a, that's a good answer. So uh, we could even think of um, telling our friends over in, in Switzerland and France who run this humongous uh, accelerator called CERN. Maybe there's some experiments they can do that's related to it. It may cost a few billion, maybe 20 million. <laughs> yeah, but so, certainly the, the, the kinds of predictions will be different than what yeah. we're doing here. And so, so I, but, but what they exactly are, I, I don't know. All right. Any other questions? We've got the world experts here. It's a chance in a lifetime. There's no such thing, in my opinion, as a bad question. OK, this could be the first bad question I've ever asked, but uh, anybody else? Uh, so I wanted, I wanted to also ask uh, Alyssa explicitly uh, if you want to have any comments on on the talk or had any thoughts from a philosophical point of view. You know, what what issues were you were going through your mind as this was being raised? Does this, does this touch on any um, things that interest the philosophy philosophers? This is all very interesting. Um, I guess the one issue that, that I feel like I've asked you this before, um, this like peaking kind of measurement that you're doing, um, it's not a violation of the idea that if you actually have a true measurement collapse, that um, there is a time asymmetry, right? Because you're not completely collapsing the wave function, you're just like Peter was saying, you don't hit it with enough energy to go to the next shelf, right? Uh, so what do you want to call this process? I mean, this is still, I, mean, how, I just don't know how are you conceptualizing this. It's somewhere intermediate between a measurement collapse and something else? Or? Yeah, so, so, so certainly you wouldn't classify it as a unitary operation or a Schrodinger evolution, right? This is certainly a uh, measurement in the sense that you gain information, but the difference from the usual measurements is you don't gain uh, maximal information, you gain partial information. So there's still ambiguity inherent in the measurement process. And that was why Mentator was showing, for example, these overlapping distributions of photon counts. When you found a particular result like seven, that didn't tell you for sure I'm in the upper shelf. It just said, I'm mostly sure I'm in the upper shelf. Why are you sure that it's not Schrodinger evolution? 
Well, so what you can do is you can check, so you can write down equations of motion, describe this, and you can't write that in terms of a Hamiltonian, for example. So the way you would you normally write, solve quantum mechanical problems, is say I write down the Hamiltonian, and then I would solve the, the, how that quantum uh, wave function or coherence of position changes and the influence of whatever potentials or forces happen to be acting upon it. And that would give you some equations uh, telling you how the state changes. And so that certainly is not able to be, uh, that kind of mixture is not able to be applied here. It won't, won't give you the right answer. But there are some people who think that wave functions never collapse. And so if we're describing a non-relativistic system, all we have are, all we have is Schrodinger evolution. So surely they, would just describe this as some systems interacting with each other and... Okay, so this is a good question. This is exactly the kind of thing we brought you here to pass okay. for us about, Melissa. Very good. So, so, so within quantum world, so quantum world is, is strange enough as it is, but what's in, one of the funny things about the quantum mechanics is that people don't always agree about what it means. Some people, even though they all agree on the equations, the way they think about it in their head Many people have different ways of approaching it. Okay? Yeah, many worlds interpret and, and so there are different interpretations of this quantum mechanics. So, so Alyssa is bringing up one of those called the many worlds interpretation. And so in that interpretation, every time what, what we would describe as a, as a measurement, they, the many worlds interpretation would say, you didn't make a measurement, your world just divided in two. So you have this world, but you have some parallel world you don't have access to. And the thing that happened in this world, the complementary thing happened in the other world. You can't ever see that. You just see the world that you're on. Okay? So this is this is one interpretation of quantum mechanics. And so let me say, the results Kater and I presented here are just the results of the quantum formalism. So I say they're interpretation agnostic in the sense that they would apply to all interpretations. What I mean by that is every different person that has an interpretation of quantum mechanics would agree with the outcomes of what we're doing. They would write down the same equations, but what's going through their mind when they look at those equations, they look at these figures, is something different, okay? So, um, so, so the, the mini-worlders would look at these, brand, these, these stochastic lines and say, that corresponds to every time you use zig or zag, that's another world being created in a, in a kind of I don't know, what would you call that? Sort of a lightning bolt explosion of universes going on. I think, I think well, it's absolutely true that this is interpretation agnostic, but I think that one thing we can do as experimentalists and theorists is come up with situations where one interpretation kind of gets you the answer faster or is a little easier to think about. And this idea of you know, lightning bolts of, of many worlds being generated in every possible stochastic trajectory, these states that are ever so, just very close together with one another, it just seems sort of, maybe that's perfectly fine intuition, but my sense is that many worlds interpretation makes a lot of sense when you have these complete collapses, this option or this option here, but now we have this whole continuum of options in between. It's, it seems like a, the, the many is a, the many, many infinite world. Yeah, well, I guess you could think about like you know your photons that are being measured every time you're you're measuring a photon. There is a discrete. That's a like a that's like a world being shot. So. Although I hate to say that we really didn't actually measure photons in this case. We measured uh, the field quadrature, which is a continuous variable. Yeah. So really, it's it is a continuum of possibilities. So the discreteness of different worlds is is, is blurred by these types of, of measurements. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, so many yes, yes, yes. Oh, justice. Oh, yes. So at the beginning of this talk, you showed uh, this very nice blue ball picture and mentioned something about friction. And then oh, friction. Oh, friction. Oh, God. That yes. spoiled the whole story and said, oh, that, that gave away the punchline. We know which way things are going. Yeah. What's the quantum equivalent of this friction? Oh, the quantum friction. Peter knows all about quantum okay. friction, so I want him to answer it. So, yeah, quantum friction. When we do these experiments, we wish that when you let them alone, nobody peeked in the box. 
But it turns out that the best we can do, there's still something peeking out of box. There's still somehow photons getting in there. There's little microscopic fluctuators that are in some sense making measurements of our system. And that's the quantum friction. They're actually measuring what's going on. And so in order for us to do our experiments, we have to do them fast enough that you know, the pool balls are still moving at the end of the, 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 the video we're taking. But this quantum friction is the real bane of our existence. And that when we just let it sit by itself, it's still, we can't ever turn the measurement off. So you can think of it as just continuously someone sneaking a few photons into our box, measuring it when we're not intending them to. And although what enables these experiments is that after 30, 40, 50 years of research in creating and controlling quantum systems, We've reached a place where the quantum friction is negligible. It's almost negligible. We write papers and we can leave friction out, and the data looks beautiful without any concern. Um, this decoherence, the, the disturbance of this, this quantum superposition. Uh, so we're to a point where we can almost ignore it. And when you get the friction really gone, then you can start to build a quantum computer or something that works with these quantum laws without slowing down. Uh, so that's this thing we're starting to work. So I just wanted to end by pointing to our mascot for this talk, coming back to the Roman god Janus. So, so, so Janus is the Roman god of time. He has two faces. With one face, he looks into the future. With the other face, he looks into the past. And so the mascot is this, this is this time symmetry, that, that we're able to run these measurements uh, forward in time with some set of outcomes, or we can run them backward in time uh, and have a similar kind of picture. So that's this time reversal invariant picture. And so I thought this was a particularly appropriate uh, mascot for us. And since we busy videotaped this talk, you'll be able to play it in reverse. And see if it makes more sense. sense. <laughs> Thank you for your you yourself where the movies are going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's thank our, our wonderful speakers again. And uh, stay tuned, we have some more of these kinds of events in the future.